hey, I just wanted to come out with, with a quick video about um, the difference between universalism and universal salvation, right? Universalism is like, hey, you know, all roads lead to God, yada, yada, yada. And that is not what the Bible presents as universal salvation, right? Universal salvation is the idea that Jesus is the savior of all people, okay? Um, and it's not a, it, it's not a denial, right? Let me, take, let me take my glasses off, right? It's not a denial that, that Jesus is the savior, okay? Um, going through these things, I'm just going to list like, this is not like a small list of scriptures, okay? Um, this, it, it, it's wide throughout the Bible, okay? Um, the Pharisees found themselves in hot water for denying the universe at like the uh, the universal salvation of all people in Jesus because they didn't like it just wasn't in their cards to do so um and you, you find huge Christian sects that just don't accept that Jesus is the universal salvation of all people and they they'll they'll throw all types of conditions and limits um, they're going to say things like in the charismatic movement, they're going to say things like, you know, you need to have, you need to speak in tongues or that you need to be a miracle worker, or you need to be a member of the fivefold ministry. Calvinism is going to come at it and say, Hey, uh, you need to be elect. And if you're not elect, well then Jesus didn't die for you. Or like you have the Arminian said, said Jesus died for everybody, but they need to make him, you know, they, they need to have a born again experience and make Jesus Christ Lord of their lives. Um, today, we're going to see through these scriptures that none of that's the actual case. And that Jesus's death actually accomplished some things, um, namely making us alive, right? Remember, um, they were dead, right? When, I mean, dead, like no possibility for faith, no possibility for making the, the right choice. No possibility for anything because you're dead. And the dead don't, you know, do these things. And and we're going to talk today. I'm going to go through like a list of scriptures that I've been working on and just working through so that people can get an, an idea and can actually understand that this is a biblical doctrine. And this is biblical. It, this isn't just some fairy tale made up by people like, you know, thousands of years ago. Okay. Um, the first one we're going to start off with is, with is Ephesians 2, 4 to 5. Okay. It emphasizes God's grace and mercy, making us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Telling us that salvation is a divine action rather than a human response. So when you have Jesus up on the cross and he was dead, he died. Okay. He went to the tomb and then he was made alive through the power of God and the Holy Spirit. And when that happened, he did it for every single human being. Okay? It's not rocket theology. Next one we're going to go over to is Romans 5.18. It states that one, act, one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Pointing to the universal salvific act of Jesus applied to all humanity. Okay? This is not a, he might have died for you if you make the sinner's confession. This is not you were elect in the first place. And this is not have speaking in tongues or doing those other things. You know, in the charismatic revival stuff. You know, fast 80 days. You know, don't drink water. Um, the next scripture that we're going to talk about is 1 Timothy 2, 4 to 6. God affirms his universal, his universal desire for all people to be saved. N Noting Jesus' ransom as being for all people. 1 Corinthians 5.22 directly states that in Christ, all will be made alive. Okay? All. And that's suggesting a universal resurrection. Oh, no. We can't have these dirty, rotten sinners in our lives. And you know, No, it doesn't work like that because Jesus made them holy and you should shut your mouth. It's, it's pretty simple. John 12, 32. Jesus, is, Jesus promises to draw all people to himself when he's lifted up, implying universal salvation. Romans eleven thirty two. God's purpose in allowing all to fall into disobedience is to have mercy on all, implying universal aim for salvation. 
John 3.17, Jesus' mission is stated to save the world, not condemn it. Not condemn it. That, that means the world isn't going to be destroyed by fire. It's not, you know, God's not coming back and going to kill 100 billion people and then torture them forever in his little magic lake of fire. All right? It's just not going to happen. I, I know that's, the, that's like the dream of most people. They, they dream of leaving their body and, and then, you know, watching all these wicked people burn forever in hell and torturing them with sticks, you know. They're, they're, they're really sick and demented. Luke 2.10 the angel announces the birth of Jesus as good news, causing great joy for all the people. Colossians 1.20, the purpose of Jesus' sacrifice is to reconcile himself to all things. Now think about that just, just for a minute, right? Just for a minute, to reconcile all things to himself. Just, uh, just take a minute, breathe it in, because <laughs> it's good news. <laughs> 1 John 2.2, 2, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Ta-da! 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3, nine. the Lord is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 1 Timothy 4.10, God is identified as the Savior of all men, especially of the believers. 1 Corinthians 15.22-28, reaffirms the concept that in Christ all will be made alive. Romans. 5, 6 to 8 highlights that Christ died for the ungodly, implying salvation that precedes belief. Before you believe, before anything happens, you were made alive with Christ. <laughs> and that's some really good news to be excited about. Titus 2.11, God's grace offers salvation to all people. Um, there, there, there's that word offer there, though, and they're stated much strongly in other translations. So it's God's brings salvation to all people okay it's not an offer it's not something that you have to like quote unquote you know like get down on your knees and just crown jesus lord of your life like he needs your crown because he doesn't he was crowned by the father um romans 6 8 32 god gave his own son for us all implying universal provision how many people all john John 1 29, Jesus identified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 2 Corinthians 5 19, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. 1 John 4 14 affirms that Jesus was sent to be the Savior of the world. Again, not the condemner, not the great fire bringer and burn all the world and, you know, fry it up and create some new cosmos. No, the plan was from the beginning. Here on earth is Eden, here on earth in people, heaven and earth meet where Jesus is seated inside of us at God's right hand, executing good life for us and, and peace and joy and love and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control. That's all the stuff that's at God's right hand. God's, in, in Psalms, it talks about how there are pleasures at God's right hand. And, and I'm going to tell you that pleasure is the joy of salvation. That I mean, that is going to get you. Because you're going to realize what exactly God did and, and how he moved forward with all of this. Um, John 6.51, Jesus says, everyone who eats of the living bread himself will live forever. It's just right there. It's not going anywhere. Jesus is the, the, the bread that came from down from heaven. He is the logos. He's the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and by hearing the logos or the person. And where do you hear God? You hear God from within. Okay. And you'll be able to hear God from, from without too. There are other people, Doma gifts that come from Jesus to the church to help the church grow and become mature sons and daughters of God. And also other people. Okay. Um, Acts. 321 references the time when God will restore everything, implying a universal scope. Now, if God's plan is to restore everything, does it, does it make any sense for him to come and blow up everything? No, it doesn't, especially if he's talking about the earth. Luke 19.10, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. 
implying his proactive choice in the role of saving everyone. Hebrews 2, 9, Jesus tasted death for everyone so that they may be saved. So if Jesus tasted death for everyone, right? What, what, I mean, I don't get it. Like, what, what, what does that leave your decision or or your faith, or your belief, or anything that comes of you, because you don't have that faith anymore. You actually have the living and abiding faith of Jesus Christ. Like the faith that was once delivered to all the saints. And humanity is now the saints. 2 Corinthians 5.14 stresses that Christ's acts of dying for all resulted in all dying to their old selves. John 1, 9 identifies Jesus as the true light that gives light to everyone. So is, he, is, like, is Jesus failing on his job of giving light to people? I don't think so, man. It, like, it, no. 1 John 4, 9. God's love manifested in sending his son into the world that we might live through him. See, the gospel isn't, isn't like the ministry of death or the law. It's about the ministry of life. God is actually standing, ministering life to people. And not just like what we think of life or having a good life, you know, being a multi-billionaire CEO. Um, in my case, when back when I was in Word of Faith, you know, my, I couldn't produce a, a life like that. My faith never produced anything because it wasn't Jesus' faith. It was me playing a game of make-believe. Okay, and, and I tried to play the make-believe as best I could. Um, I, I didn't become a multimillionaire CEO. I didn't get a you know the body of a, you know a body of a Greek person. I didn't get a Victoria's Secret wife. I didn't get a Ferrari. I didn't get a mansion on the hill. And once I understood that I couldn't get those things, I thought, how in the world is, am I ever going to quote unquote make it to heaven, right? And and then I stayed you know, trapped in that cycle for a really long time. But God's life, something that, that comes from God, it's eternal because it's part of God's character and part of God's life. He actually ministers life and gives us forgiveness instead of the ministry of death. Under the law, when you made mistakes, you had to die. It, it just, the, it's just the way it went. Um, let's go to the next one. Um, God's love manifested in sending his son into the world that we might live through. I think I read that one. Hebrews 10.10. 10. We've been made holy through the sacrifice of Jesus' body once and for all. So all these attempts at like, you know, trying to live up to, to holiness by not doing something or by doing something, it's just a failure because you haven't been made holy by those things. You've been made holy by the sacrifice of Jesus' body which is also his bread, which is also his life. 1 Timothy 1.15 affirms that Christ came into the world to quote-unquote save sinners. It, 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 Christ did not come into the world to make a hell for you to go to. He actually had a mission other than sending and burning people forever in a, in a fiery torment afterlife because, you know, I don't know. Maybe Jesus' sacrifice failed for them. Oh. Um, 30, 2 Timothy 1.10. Through the gospel, Jesus has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to life. Literally, he's brought, oh man, he's brought life. He ministers life. He gives actual, factual life. Real life to live in the here and now, not in the sweet by and by. You're not going to get life when you die. You have life right now, which is what makes the gospel so exceedingly great and glorious and that you can live in it today. Um, the, the, a lot of the language is like if everything they taught me in church, right? It was always someday, but that day wasn't today. Or they were condemning me for some moral failing that I had and then trying to encourage me to get right with God. Using scriptures, using scriptures that revealed, using scriptures with the law revealing my weakness instead of revealing the life that was inside of me to live. And that's a big no-no, okay? You don't ever expose someone's stuff 
expose their weakness intentionally, being a fault finder, finding fault within them to disqualify them from life. You don't do that. That's what Pharisees got in trouble for, all right? <laughs> now, I'm going to read some of the stuff about, um, I'm just going to read some stuff that I kind of threw together um, through like chat GPT because, you know, learn, using to learn AI is going to be important for people. Um, and, and it's going to be, it's going to be an, a, a, a nice tool for people. Um, but I'm kind of worried about some of the repercussions of it, but, but anyway, right. So we're going to, we're going to do a little roasting for, for those people who find themselves on the other side of, of all this stuff, right? Ephesians two, four and five. If you think being, being alive with Christ depends on you and not God's grace and mercy, you might be more dead in your sins than you thought. Romans five eighteen. How in the world can you read justification and life for all people and still limit the reach of Jesus's righteous act? Must be some magical theological glasses you're wearing. First Timothy 4, 6. Maybe you think all people mean some people and ransom for all means a few. If so, I suggest a crash course in basic numeracy. First Corinthians fifteen twenty two. If you're not convinced that in Christ all will be made alive includes everyone, then your understanding of of all is as alive as a doorknob. John twelve thirty two. perhaps when Jesus said he would draw all people to himself, you think that he was just practicing his sketching skills. <laughs> who, who knew the Savior was also an artist? Romans eleven thirty two. if you believe God's mercy applies selectively, then your mercy meter might be as faulty as a $3 bill. John three seventeen. perhaps you view Jesus as a celestial bouncer, deciding to who gets into the party and who doesn't. Newsflash, Jesus came to save, not bounce. Luke 2.10, if you think the angel announcement of great joy for all people excludes some people, you might need to recalibrate your joy meter Colossians 1.20, you might imagine Jesus as a cosmic bookkeeper, reconciling only some accounts. But if all things doesn't mean all things, I wonder how you keep your books. 1 John 2.2, 2, I bet when you read about Jesus being the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, you imagine a world smaller than a child's snow globe. 2 <laughs> Peter 3.9. Maybe you think the Lord is like a lazy student, procrastinating on an assignment. But here's the kicker. He's patient because he doesn't want anyone to perish. 1 Timothy 4.10. The Savior of all men, especially of believers. Apparently, your dictionary has a different definition of all and especially. 1 Corinthians 15, 15, 22 to 28. In case you missed it the first time, here it is again. In Christ, all will be made alive. Seriously, how many times does this need to be said? Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. I know, I know, the ungodly being saved is an inconvenient truth. <laughs> but last time I checked, inconvenient doesn't mean untrue. Titus 2.11. Maybe in your world, offers salvation to all people. Reads like a restricted membership to an exclusive club. It's time for your reality check. Romans 8.32, when you read, For us all, I guess you must imagine a VIP list with some names suspiciously missing. John 1.29, I can just see you at this scene. John, John identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you're like, sure, but not that guy's sin, or that one's. 2 Corinthians 5.19, perhaps you think that God was reconciling the world to himself. He was doing a sloppy job and left some pieces out. Surely God needs help to up his game. 1 John 4.14, 4, 4, here's a juicy one. Savior of the world apparently means savior of some people in the world. Who knew semantics, semantics could be so malleable? John 6.51, if Jesus says anyone who eats the living bread will live forever. But if you think it's only for some, perhaps you need a lesson in sharing. Isaiah 45, 22, even in the Old Testament gets it. God wants all the ends of the earth to turn and be saved. But maybe you think God's arms are too short to save that far. Acts three twenty one. if you think the time to restore everything doesn't actually mean everything, then your everything must be as empty as a politician's <laughs> promise. Luke 19.10, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. But let me guess, you've got a list of people who are so lost, not even Jesus can find them. Hebrews 2.9, Jesus tasted death for everyone. Maybe in your universe, everyone is as limited as a toddler's understanding of quantum physics. 
2 Corinthians 5.14, when you read about Christ dying for all, do you imagine a smaller crowd than a low-budget concert? Because last time I checked, all means all. John 1.9, perhaps the true light that gives light to everyone has a dimmer switch in, in your Bible. 1 John 4.9, maybe you think the manifestation of God's love through Jesus somehow skipped a few beats. But here's a new flash. We means we. Hebrews 10.10, if you think you've been made holy through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ once and for all, but all doesn't include everyone, then you'll almost be as limited as a hermit's social calendar. Hey, now, I'm, I'm a hermit. I, I don't go out anymore. I don't, you know, associate with people all that much. I'm more just praying, looking for a job, and just living life. Just living, actually. Like, really just living. Um, First Timothy... <laughs> because <laughs> it's life it's about life it's about life here now in this present truth in like ay 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 I'm like ah uh, it's so divinely filling and it's so precious and it's so good you know um okay Oh, I have no idea. Like First Timothy one fifteen. Oh, so Jesus came into the world to save sinners, but only certain sinners. <laughs> Let's not get ourselves. Second Timothy one ten. I suppose when you read about Jesus destroying death and bringing life and immortality to light, you must have a selective, very selective demolition job <laughs> and a less than illuminating light show. Like it just none of this stuff makes any sense, right? It's why it's why people get. That's why people got in so much trouble for denying Jesus. This is why they got in trouble for it. Because they were denying that Jesus was the savior for all people. And Jesus roasted those guys. I mean, he roasted them. How Jesus like talked to them, like how Jesus talked to the Pharisees, you, you could see it. And you could also see Jesus said, I wanted to gather you all too. And Jesus even died for those people. And, and the problem that, that modern day Christianity has is they, they've disconnected and, they, and they've become the judge of who Jesus has died for and not died for. And it's, it's dangerous. It's so stinking dangerous. Don't do it. Um, anyway, so those are kind of like the scriptures. And, and the main point of this is like, look, we were made alive before we believed, repented, did anything that we were made alive with Christ. And and the whole kit and caboodle of salvation is from Jesus. You know, we're not having, we're not placed on the planet to, to make good decisions, have magical faith that have a magical personal faith that gets us up into the heavenlies somewhere. But we've actually, in factually been given the very faith of Jesus. And that, and that faith is the faith that really saves because that's the, what the faith that comes by hearing. Okay. And hearing by the logos. Like, and, and the Logos is a person named Jesus who is the son of God in the flesh in a body. Um, and and that, that's so important to grasp because when, when you begin to like grasp that Jesus came in exact human flesh, not different human flesh, the same flesh that we have. It, it, it begins to really change your mind and change your ideas about this, this whole thing. Um, and life is, it's, like, I'm going to tell you, and I, you know, I spoke in tongues before I ever got really saved. Like, I was doing the charismatic thing. I was doing the word of faith thing. I, I, I experienced many great things. But never once in that time did I ever experience God's life. And now I experience God's own life. And that is the stuff. You know, like, you know, you can walk around blitzed out of your gourd. Like Paul says, it's an ecstasy and it's an ecstasy that you can just 
take as much as you need, take as much as you want, take, ay, 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 because Jesus, like, oh my gosh, you, the, the worst thing people do is you got it. They, they teach you have to get hungry for Jesus, right? It's the worst teaching ever in, in the entire world. Jesus says that I came so that you could be satisfied, right? And if, like, if you're not satisfied with what Jesus is doing in your life today, like you got a different Jesus than the Jesus than the one that's in the Bible because he's coming, he's telling you to come, get satisfied, satisfy yourself with me, eat my flesh, drink my blood. You're going to live forever. And I know that's really offensive to Christians saying that we're going to live forever because they're, they have their hopes set on going to heaven and, and, and being a disembodied spirit forever with their little personal faith and their little personal Jesus who never really does anything for him anyway. And I, it, he's never like, I'm, I'm telling you that personal Jesus is an utter failure and not the person and, and not the Jesus revealed by the father. Cause like, it, like personal faith is, is not the way to go. Having the faith of Jesus is the way to go. <laughs> That's where you're going to actually find that there are things that produce off of you because now the father and you are one and your work and your, just like Jesus came with a mission from the father, you've come with a mission from the father. <laughs> like you're actually co laboring to bring about the ministry of reconciliation. Do you know how cool that is? And, and you know how the other cool part is like his commands and his words aren't burdensome. Like it's not this heavy yoke, like that that's been placed upon you. It's this lightness of love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, goodness, self-control, and that even when you're in the most darkest moments of your life that, that you think are literal Sheol or the literal places of death, you can't run from the love of God because he's right there stuck with you. Like this stuff goes so far and beyond of, of, of what we've been able to express, right? Um, ah, good Lord. Woo. Anyway. I love you guys. Take care. Renounce your personal faith and take the faith of Jesus. <laughs> Cause once you do that, like it's on like Donkey Kong. All right. Love you. Take care.